100 Years of Cox. This is the story of 10 siblings from the Machel Cox family, my maternal relatives, who were born in England between 1868 to 1884. They wrote letters to each other continuously from 1906 to the 1970s. As they died, their children then continued the letter chain until the 1980s. My name is Francis, and this podcast might appeal to you if you have an interest in history or geography, especially social history or family history. I have the Bodleian Library in Oxford to thank for these letters. Sir Christopher Machel Cox, Fellow of New College, and his brother David, Fellow of University College, were the sons of one of the ten siblings. If they had not gifted a hundreds of boxes of documents to the Bodleian in the 1980s for safekeeping, I would not be reading these letters now. Twenty years ago, my Auntie Judy told me about a pile of letters in the Bodleian Library, one of the oldest libraries in the world. She'd never been there or read any of them. I was intrigued. I live in Australia, so it has taken me a while, and so far I have read from 1906 to 1934. I need another visit to Oxford, as I have many decades of letters still to read. As well as hundreds of letters written by the ten siblings, there are also letters written by their father, the Reverend Dr John Charles Cox, my great-great-grandfather. He was a well-known writer and antiquarian in the 1800s. You can find out who he was by searching for his name online, as he wrote a lot of books. I have letters that he wrote to his children, as well as letters written by his mother-in-law, my third great-grandmother. Matilda Machel was a member of the illustrious old English family, the Machels of Crackenthorpe Hall in Cumbria, whose history and genealogy has been traced back to the 1200s. Twenty letters of Matilda's have survived from the 1820s, sadly not the original letters, but transcriptions. I will read them in a later podcast. She was from a wealthy family and was an intelligent, highly musical young debutante who wrote letters describing the concerts and parties she attended in the well-to-do part of West London in which she lived during the season each year in the 1820s. Imagine the candle-lit dances depicted in Jane Austen movies. This is the same world Matilda inhabited. She writes about the people she likes and, cuttingly, also about those she can't stand. Back to the ten siblings, one of whom, Edmund, was my great-grandfather, an Anglican priest who spent over 40 years as a parish priest in the village of Hallam Fields in Derbyshire. The siblings were born between 1868 and 1884. There were five members of the older family, a daughter, Enid, followed by four boys, Edmund, Arthur, Neville and Wilfred. There is then a gap of four years before another five children are born, known as the younger family, three boys, Bernard, Aldwyn and Cuthbert, followed by the two little girls, Avis and Vera. Can you imagine giving birth to 10 children in just 16 years? Wow. Picture, if you will, a large extended family on holiday in Porlock, Somerset, in the southwest of England. The date is August 1906, and the family have taken rooms at Birchanger Farm for a month, where they have been enjoying excursions, bicycling, walking and bathing. Let me introduce the family to you. Reverend Dr John Charles Cox and his wife Marion had ten children, who grew up playing cricket and tennis all day long, cared for by domestic servants who they clearly adored. They lived in the large 19th century Victorian rectories, adjacent to the rural Anglican churches in the villages where their father ministered, Enville, Barton the Street, and then Holdenby. The children were schooled initially by their mother, and later by Enid, the eldest sister, before all the boys boarded at private prep schools around the age of eight. The boys then all go on to the elite private boys' schools of the late 1800s, and most of them continue on to Oxford or Cambridge. 
By 1906, the ten children are now adults. The British Empire still rules the world, and three foreign brothers live in the distant colonies, leaving seven home siblings. Neville works for the railways in South Africa. Wilfred builds roads in British Columbia. And the Reverend Aldwin is an Anglican missionary in Nyasaland in Africa, now Malawi, ministering to the African natives. In England, we have Enid, Edmund, another Anglican priest, Arthur, Bernard, Cuthbert, Avis and Vera, seven siblings aged between 22 and 37. Mother is a kindly, staid Victorian woman in her 60s, terrified of modern motor cars, accustomed to servants and a life of privilege, yet able to run a household of servants and multiple children, whilst patiently dealing with her difficult clergyman husband, who could never be described as a modern man. Father can be tyrannical. He is a born controversialist with a flaming, indignant passion for causes he feels to be unjust especially the rights of the working man. His character developed during his Derbyshire political days in the 1870s, and he is a fount of all knowledge with regards to Derbyshire churches, as well as being a noted antiquarian. He somehow found time, in between publishing books, to be an Anglican parish priest. Now retired, he is still publishing books, as well as writing for the Church Times newspaper and the Reliquary Periodical. He is a kindly but stubborn man with a great dislike of housemaids who attempt to tidy his study. Back to Porlock in Somerset. If you've been to Somerset, you will know that it is green and idyllic. It is a sunny August afternoon in 1906, as long ago summer days always seem to be. The family are in a meadow near Porlock Weir with a picnic. The older generation, including several maiden aunts, are reclining under parasols with lemonade, whilst the younger generation are playing cricket. Cuthbert, you are out, calls Vera, looking hot and dishevelled and distinctly unladylike. She would rather be playing hockey, but cricket is an acceptable second best. Avis is exhausted after getting ten runs, but knows she can't give up and be the one to let the side down. Meanwhile, Dr Cox, father, climbs over the stile and joins the group. He has just returned from visiting the church in the next village, Luckham, where his own father was the parson many decades ago. Dr Cox has just walked through the garden adjacent to the church, for old time's sake, with its three alternate paths leading from rectory to church, low church, high church and broad church. Reverend Cox Senior named the three paths whilst Dr Cox was still a small boy. The affectionate titles appeal to his argumentative personality and make him smile. Dr Cox pats his pocket to check his notebook is still there. He has been making notes on Luckham Church for his next book, English Church Furniture, which his friend Algernon and Methuen will publish in 1907. There is nothing that Dr Cox enjoys more than exploring a country church and making notes on the fabric and furnishings. It is an essential activity to be completed on every holiday in every county. He can easily lose a day reading the registers in the vestry as well. Dr Cox has not yet completed How to Write the History of a Parish, and is unaware that his book will be a runaway success in the world of the Anglican Church a hundred years ago. Dr Cox looks at his son's daughters and nieces playing cricket. It is quite a recent thing for upper middle class families to allow their daughters to play sport and to ride a bicycle. Dr Cox wasn't sure at first, thinking it would affect the marriage prospects of his daughters, but his wife Minnie convinced him. It's just as well that he did, as Vera will soon become captain of the England ladies hockey team and Dr Cox will brag to all his friends about his daughter the international. Cuthbert enjoys cricket and likes to think he is athletic. He is a schoolmaster at Berkhamsted and plays football for the old boys team, but it's awfully hard work keeping up with Vera. Their cousins Carr and Hester reluctantly join in. Neither are as keen on cricket as Vera. Carr, Laird Cox, is preoccupied with thoughts of the place she has gained at Newnham College, 
and going up to Cambridge at the start of term. It is a radical thing for a young woman to be going up to university in 1906, but she is already a feminist and will soon become a supporter of the suffragettes. Carr doesn't yet know that she will soon meet the poet Rupert Brooke, embark on a tempestuous relationship with him, become a member of the wildly unconventional Bloomsbury set and generally shock and alarm her traditional Anglican family. Bernard is caught out. He mops his brow with his handkerchief. His noble moustache is damp and glistening. Bernard is a London stockbroker and he's not as fit as some of his brothers and sisters. He wishes Neville was with them. He is a good cricketer. Next year, Bernard. In 12 months, Neville, sibling number four, will be home from Africa on leave and you will be able to play cricket with him then. Vera is the youngest of the ten siblings and a very good bowler. She is very athletic and can outrun all her brothers. She could outcycle them too if it wasn't for the long skirts she is obliged to wear. Dorothy is next up to bat. She is married to Arthur, who holds position number three in the family. She watches intently as Vera prepares the bowl, then at the last moment changes her hands and her position and bats left-handed to howls of protest from the fielding side. Dorothy, that's just not on. Arthur, we've had this discussion before. Arthur shrugs his shoulders while Dorothy grins, watching the fielders scramble to locate the lost ball. His wife is very much the modern woman. She does things her way and there is little he can do about it, even if he wanted to, which he doesn't. Arthur is a big fan of cricket and contemplates how it is much more enjoyable to play with the family than it is to teach cricket to small boys at Garfield House School in Plymouth, where he is both headmaster and owner. Later that evening, we can watch through the window of the comfortable farmhouse drawing room, as Cuthbert entertains the family by singing a few songs in his fine baritone voice, and Avis plays the piano. With no TV or radio or social media, families make their own entertainment. The maids have cleared away the meal, and Mother is talking about her idea that her children should begin a budget, as Avis and her fellow students from Teacher Training College have done. You are probably perplexed as to what a budget is. Let me explain. In the 1800s, the word budget referred to a collection of news or letters. The Pall Mall budget used to be a London newspaper. So a family budget was a collection of letters and family news. The use of the word budget to refer to government financial plans came later. But Avis, protested Cuthbert, your students start their budget with dear beetles and dear buttercups. He is a schoolmaster at Berkhamsted School and he finds such things silly. You can write dear family or dear brothers and sisters, says mother patiently. I am not as young as I was and I will not always be able to write a letter each week to every one of you. But I like your letters, Mother, says Avis. Mother will continue to write to us, explained Bernard, but our family budget will just be for the brothers and sisters, not the parents. Humph! Sounds like a lot of nonsense. Father is not impressed. Enid will be delighted with the idea, states Vera, who is always matter-of-fact. But what about Edmund? Neither Edmund nor Enid, the two eldest siblings, are spending the August family, are spending the August holidays with the family in Somerset. That is precisely the reason for my suggestion, Mother explains to her children. I've been worried about him ever since he travelled to Kansas and became a cowboy. And then there was that terrible shotgun incident during the opening of the Cherokee Strip. I was surprised he came back and decided to enter holy orders, declares father. I thought he was happy running a store in America. But he did return, insisted mother. He somehow passed his compulsory Greek. He likes his parish in Derbyshire, despite no one else of his class living nearby. But most of you rarely see him. Enid hasn't seen him for years and he's losing touch with you all. I will write to him and insists that he must participate. 
And if a Victorian matriarch declared something would happen, it generally did. The family budget was started by Bernard in September 1906. He wrote the first letter and then posted it on to Cuthbert, who then wrote a letter and then posted both on to Arthur, and so it would continue. Vera wrote a letter, then Avis, and then finally Enid, who was last on the list. The package of letters would then be dispatched by Enid back to Bernard, who would then begin the next round. Each sibling wrote with their own news, whilst also commenting on everyone else's news. Letters would be dispatched to the Colonial Brothers in British Central Africa, South Africa and British Columbia, telling them of the new family enterprise. All three loved the idea and they eagerly awaited each budget being posted abroad for them to read in turn. Disastrously, some budgets are lost in the post. The budget becomes a living, breathing creature to the siblings and they grieve each loss acutely. Edmund would be told by mother that he was obliged to join in. He would also be informed that, like the others, he would have just one week to read the letters, write his own contribution and then post the parcel on. He would agree and he joined the budget in its second round in October 1906. Entertainingly, Edmund became a real delinquent, forgetting to write, and he was regularly told off by his younger brothers and sisters for taking too long. The ten contributors developed a lifelong habit of writing for the budget. Spoiler alert, the siblings wrote budget letters for the rest of their lives. As they died, their children continued the habit, and the last poignant letter was written in 1987. I like this idea mused Vera. We can tell each other all our news. I shall tell you all about hockey. Bernard will tell us about the stock exchange. Arthur and Cuthbert will tell us funny stories about what the schoolboys get up to. Enid will tell news of Liverpool. Edmund will talk about what happens in Derbyshire and Avis will describe all her little dodges as a governess, continued Mother. As long as no one criticises my handwriting said Cuthbert firmly. Arthur grinned. He was an entertaining and clever wordsmith, excellent at poetry, and he thoroughly enjoyed writing long and informative letters, but he knew Cuthbert's handwriting to be generally diabolical. He was already eagerly anticipating the entertaining criticisms that were bound to arise. I like the idea of writing one letter which goes to everybody. That seems so much easier than having to write so many letters to all of you. Avis already thought it was a good idea. But you never do, Avis, although you do really mean to, declared Vera. You must admit that you are disorganised and always late and that you rarely get around to writing to us. That's true, lamented Avis, to peals of good-natured laughter from her family. <laughs> Budget letter number one, started by Bernard, sibling number six, on the 19th of September 1906, and written from his stockbroker's offices at 29 Threadneedle Street in London. Dear brothers and sisters, I have been asked by a portion of the family to start the budget on its travels, so here goes. My first difficulty was to know how to address the family in a suitable and comprehensive way. The House of Education students, I believe, start their respective budgets with some such phrase as Dear Beetles or Dear Buttercups. This mode of address does not appeal to me. Perhaps it is better to leave it open to all to begin how they like. You will probably think that I cannot be very busy and you will be right. Business on the stock exchange just now is non-existent. If any of you want to make a change in your investments, Please hurry up. I expect I shall be told not to write shop or not to advertise. Well, there is very little news at home. Our holiday party is broken up. Cuthbert returned to Berkhamstead last Sunday and Avis to Hartford yesterday evening. 
Perhaps some of you may like to hear about Avis's winter clothes, obtained from Enid's dressmaker in Liverpool. She returned from Liverpool with two perfect ducks of hats. One is black beaver and the other I cannot describe, but the general effect is blue. It has a very saucy shape. She has also got a new coat and skirt made, with which, an unusual thing for her, she is quite enraptured. The colour has been variously described as purple, heather, maroon, heliotrope, mahogany and also beetroot. Avis will be able to tell you herself which colour is correct. It is very well cut and shows off her admirable figure to advantage. Another purchase is a flannel blouse with a collar, which I believe is detachable. This pleases her very much, although she was rather afraid she looked like Vera. Doubtless there are other garments, but these are all I know of. Mother has bought a new smocked waterproof of the usual shape and hue. I believe a new hat arrives today, which will be very exciting. Our great anxiety is to know whether it will sit straight. I don't think Vera has prepared for the winter yet, beyond embroidering a little white horse to wear on her hat when she plays hockey for Kent. Poor father is suffering from severe headaches, which come on regularly every evening about seven o'clock. He is trying various remedies. Arthur will be interested to hear that the latest remedy he is trying is OXO. A long and interesting letter arrived from Aldwyn last night. It will probably get around the family long before you read this. He seems to have had a rough time of it during the latter part of his journey out to Africa. But it is pleasant to notice his highly developed sense of humour. The lost cork of Miss Parsons' tea bottle seems to have caused him as much amusement as the old Portuguese man's abandoned fruit in a previous letter. Cuthbert, I enclose a cutting from the Times, relating to the marriage of A.J. Crowder. Is this the old Berkhamsteadian? The father of the bride is an old client of ours. I believe we are to make use of the budget for passing on the names of interesting books. Here are some I have lately read. The Viper of Milan by M. Bowen. Very good. Beyond the Wall by J. H. Yoxall. Good. A striking style which I cannot quite make up my mind about. The Rogue's Tragedy by Capes. The plot was good, but very difficult to get through. The writing seems very forced and artificial. A good story, but spoiled. The House by the Bridge by Easton. Very good in parts, worth reading. The Fifth Queen by F. Maddox Huefa about Henry VIII's Fifth Queen. Decidedly interesting. I should like to read a sequel to it, though I am told that the heroine became too bad for a lot to be written about her. Richard Baldock by A. Marshall. I liked this book very much indeed, though it is rather spun out. Voyage of the Discovery by Captain Scott, all about the South Pole. If any of you have not read this, get it now, if you care at all for travel and exploration. The most interesting book of the sort that I have ever read. I will post this on now and I look forward to reading many letters from you all in a few weeks. Your affectionate brother, Bernard. Arthur. He writes from Birchanger Farm, Porlock, in Somerset, on the 4th of September 1906. He and his wife Dorothy are still on holiday, although the rest of the family have returned to their homes. Arthur started writing his letter before Bernard started his. Dear family in general and nobody in particular, I start betimes on my contribution to the budget, having an uncomfortable feeling that when the call comes, I might shrink from the ordeal unless I had a bit already laid by. In the first place, my wife Dorothy is much taken with the idea and would like to partake. On the understanding that she may dispense with writing herself, unless, as is likely, she feels moved to do so. In the second place, I give notice that I can in no way hold myself responsible for any of the opinions 
or statements of the said wife Dorothy, who, as is well known, will have her say. I wish that I had already at least Cuthbert's instalment before me for guidance. As a man of letters, he will probably base his literary style on that of the Upton letters. If so, I shall be the first to appreciate it. But I hope that Avis will follow her natural bent with her facile pen and that Bertram will not seek altogether to eschew, correct use of infinitive, the frivolous trivialities of ephemeral correspondence. And now, full steam ahead! I'm really getting saturated with the atmosphere of the sea, having just finished a second book by Edward Noble called Waves of Fate. It is a very powerful book, and I like it, although it is sad. Incidentally, one is worried by the weird ejaculations introduced haphazardly in ordinary conversation. I've had an unusual amount of reading in the last two days because the toe that I wounded in my last bathe became rather troublesome and I've had to keep it quiet. Kind friends, don't forget to sympathise, even though it will have been sound and well ages before you read this. That has always been the worst of my ailments. I never can keep bad long enough to feel entitled to sympathy, which only comes by return of post when I am recovered. It is also a great grievance to me that these blackberries, with which we are surrounded in the greatest profusion, are disgusting to the taste. I wonder how you all stood the return journey to Sydenham yesterday, and what game you are playing with Edmund now. September 25th. I am now back in Devonport, and the budget has arrived today, sooner than I had expected. I have to say I have been very much edified. Tonight is an off time for me, so I hope to get ahead fast, having a good deal to say. First of all, I will go back a bit to the end of my time at Birchanger Farm. Dorothy, please skip. I discovered that with luck and knowledge of the country, you can see a great deal of a hunt on foot, and I had two great days. The first was a meet at Lark Barrow, a wet and misty morn and a long tramp, but a wonderfully fine sight, with every hill lined by columns advancing out of the mist and converging from every direction on Lark Barrow. I was practically the only pedestrian, but there were at least 200 riders. I got to the place where they put the buglers in and had a fine view of a grand stag and five hinds, which came out just in front of me. Two or three riders began to move after them when they had passed, and got finally cursed. They had a great deal of riding about, before they at last separated a stag off, and then he left half the field behind waiting, and hoping he would work round. I was more venturesome, and descended a ravine, climbed a hill at a gasping run, and arrived in time to see them put a fine stag out of some bracken. It was halfway up the hill, the hounds below, and all the field on top, and after a moment's pause, he went straight through all the horsemen and made away, with the whole pack twenty yards behind. I lost them after that for an hour or more, and then saw them all working down to the Dune Valley, which I made for. But the stag doubled back, and they killed it a mile further on. I waded the stream for the second time and made for home, as I thought. I was accompanied by a croaking raven for half a mile and saw several buzzards. By the by, the purple loose strife that father talked about so often turned out on investigation to be Rose Bay Willow Herb. I finished by losing myself entirely, but fortunately fell in with a man with some sheep and got put right when a long way from home. Two days later, there was another meet at Hawkham Head. I had explored Hawkham just before and found it a very beautiful valley swarming with blackberries. Tom Westcott and I had a long view of the deer with our field glasses as it made for Horner, keeping along the skyline and making straight for Dunkery. It got as far as that before ever the pack were laid on at all. I ran along to the Horner Valley, and there, just at our picnic place, I thought there was going to be a kill. Each side of the valley was lined with horsemen, motionless, and many of them dismounted and went downhill. 
but after all that they lost the stag, and then it proved to be a fresh stag near Dunkery, which went away very hard, straight back. I made my way back to Hawkham Head, thinking the hounds were some way behind me, when to my amazement they came swinging round the corner a hundred yards off. Suddenly the stag crossed the road, with the hounds close behind. With a fresh spurt I rushed over the moor for the poor Lock Woods, knowing he was making for the sea. I had a glimpse of Dorothy and the Westcott family all out in the meadow, and then I tore down through the wood, which was resounding with the baying of hounds and the blowing of horns. Swarms of people waited about at every corner, but I made straight for the old cricket pitch. I saw the stag burst out of the woods and into the little orchard on the way to Culbone. There he stood for a moment and tossed two hounds in the air. I ran towards the spot, thinking after all that perhaps he would be killed there. But at that moment he came rushing straight for where I was, with the hounds at his heels. He swerved into the next field and in a moment was on the beach. I scrambled after him and was within twenty yards of him as he entered the water, being a good deal nearer than anyone else. It was rough, and I didn't think he could stand it, but he went out grandly, pursued by a single hound for a good way. The huntsman then galloped up, blowing his horn for all he was worth. It was three quarters of an hour before the boat captured him. It looked very dangerous. They blindfolded him, he was at least a quarter of a mile out at sea and they tied his legs and then they hoisted him right into the boat. The men were so exhausted that they all stripped off their jerseys. The poor beast was landed on the shingle at Porlock Weir and had his throat cut bare, the hounds all coming and dabbling in his gore. A beastly finish to a grand day. Alack, my pen has run on apace. Anyhow, I assure you it all took a great deal longer to happen than it does to write, though you might not think it. Now to Devonport and Garfield House School. Moore, our new English teacher, the wild Irishman, is very shy and quiet, but I think he's very worthy, good-tempered, and he knows quite enough. I don't know what the boys think of him. He's extremely musical, and he plays for hours once he starts, principally by ear without music. Froud, the historian's grandson, he is a nice little chap, and he's very well looked after by Woolcombe, in whose dormitory he is. Froud has been violently sick today at breakfast, a touch of nature, too many overripe pears, I believe. Both of Reverend Ponsonby's children now come to Miss Wood's class, and all goes swimmingly. Yesterday, to my astonishment, I landed a new weekly boarder rejoicing in the name of Blight. What has happened to names nowadays? His mother had never heard of me before that very day, nor I of her, and one sight of me was enough, and she made her decision. She asked practically no questions, and she wanted to see no bedrooms. The boy is rather old, between 11 and 12, and has been running wild, so I dare say he will be a tartar. He comes next Monday, unless that fatal 11th hour proves unkind again. Now to developing. Those new camera films are beastly to manipulate, I think, and many are failures. But I've got some very nice photographs of the Westcott children, and the ones of father have come out decently. September 26th. Aldwin's long letter was a great interest. I'm afraid he never failed to see the ludicrous in others' misfortunes, and the dear boy must not conceal his emotions, bless his heart. I know that after his mosquito adventures, he would rejoice to learn that for days past, my sufferings have been quite untold at the hands, or jaws, of the familiar Pulex irritans. These fleas are a torment to me. I have lost at least a noggin of my best blood and I feel weak. I wonder if Oxo is good for one in such a plight. I have now got two of the books which Bernard recommends. The Viper of Milan promises very well. I have just read two books which may have come your way. Captain John Lister by Hamilton is a very cavalier story 
of a very ordinary description on the whole, though some interesting local colour is introduced, though I did not finish it. Count Bunker is a sequel to The Lunatic at Large, and quite as mad and impossible. Pure farce. Really funny at times. By the way, I see that a certain Mr. Clouston, presumably a relation of the author, has written a serious book on diseases of the mind. Dick is a really delightful book, and I have just ordered the other books by the same man. I had a funny experience with the younger winter boy this afternoon. He is generally very cheerful, but something upset him in school, and he started weeping so copiously and noisily that I had to tell him I should send him out into the playground. Whereat he suddenly started squeaking like a pig and imploring for mercy at the top of his voice as if he was being killed. The window was open and I really feared for my reputation and there was nothing for it but to take him by the scruff of his neck and turn him out into the playground. After a quarter of an hour he returned, sobered, as if nothing had happened. Mary had to go to a big dinner at the Royal Naval Hospital last night and I graciously countenanced this proceeding and forgave the slight to myself. Probably Mrs McLean thought it was sour grapes when I assured her that I was very glad to be out of it. The fact was it was another matrimonial design on Mary, who was much entertained by Mrs McLean's unstinted efforts in that direction. The gentleman in question had a hooked nose and a red face, but was very highly eligible Mary reports. Now I really must stop. There were one or two things I should like to add, but this will do. Entirely yours, individually and collectively, Arthur. P.S. Why do the male contributors come first in the list for the budget? Does woman help? Vera, St Albans, 13 Longton Avenue, Sydenham, written on October the 1st, 1906. Respected elders, being the budget baby, I feel I ought to be careful over my method of beginning. There is absolutely no news. Sydenham is being very dull just now. Health seems a good subject to begin with. Father is suffering just now from rather a bad fall in the street just outside Sydenham Station, and though he has not actually hurt himself, it has shaken him up a good deal. Mother unfortunately caught cold at 3.10pm on Saturday afternoon, through standing between an open window and the door in the drawing room for exactly the space of five seconds. Having tried Mercurius in vain, a total cure has been effected by the use of the following restoratives, aconite, smelling salts, ammoniated quinine, Elemans embrocation and camphor, used in the above order. I have been rather seedy all the week with a cold, but am better now. Before I forget, how is your cold, Avis? I am sorry, I have read no books lately worth putting down, except those already mentioned. Cuthbert, the house of the Seven Gables has somehow got into my room, but as I have not read it, I am going to keep it till I have time to. A most happy record has been created this year. I've had practically no parcels to send off of the things left behind during the holidays. Although, alas, a letter has just arrived from Aldwyn asking for his overcoat to be sent off. I may mention, in allusion to Burr's letter, that my little white horse Kent badge does not constitute the whole of my winter clothing. I have also a flannel blouse with detachable collar a magnificent brown coat and skirt, and a superb hockey outfit. I'm glad to say that hockey begins next week, and this year I've quite made up my mind to play hockey for Europe, if not for the world. Next time I write, I will let you know of Cuthbert's prowess in the football world, as I believe I'm going to watch him play at Forest Hill this Saturday, or at any rate at Catford sometime in November. I must apologise for the shortness of my letter, but Arthur's will make up for it. 
I was very interested in Arthur's hunting descriptions. It makes it so very interesting when you know the place. Your affectionate sister, Vera. P.S. I do not vouch for the truth of all my statements. And I wish people would write on this paper, foreign for preference, if it has to go abroad. And I hope people won't forget to send their old letters on to me. Avis, Stillmore, Queen's Road, Hartford, written on October the 7th, 1906. Dear family, first of all, Enid, let me know when this arrives. We have had discussions on it. I'm awfully sorry, Enid, it hasn't got off sooner. I meant to write on Sunday afternoon, and I thought that I would do, and it is the day I always write, but I forgot, and I went out to tea. It is going by the 10.30 post tonight. I say it will get to London tonight, Sunday, and you will have it by the middle of the day on Monday. Next thing, I find most people have Hartford, Hertfordshire, put on their letters and parcels, as it is safer, as they often go wrong and go to Hereford instead. My bicycle went wrong, and it went to Hartford in Cheshire, and it was five days before I got it. I liked all the letters very much, and Arthur, your description of the stag hunt was splendid. Dear me, madam, who has come to board here, talks and talks, it is not easy to write. My bicycle runs splendidly now, and is really satisfactory. Dennis is perhaps going to have one, and then I can go out with him. It will be rather jolly. You poor things, all living in the towns. I am having a lovely time in the country, with such beautiful weather, I really like the country more every year. Miss Martin, a governess who lives here, is back and really seems anxious to see me. So I can bicycle up to see her and have tea and then she comes down here and it is really rather nice. Then the two Miss Suddows are still here as lodgers for a while and Madame and I have had a little whist and bridge with them. Madame is a quaint person, one who loves the Daily Mail she thinks the Standard and the Royal are awfully clever and amusing magazines. She loves to say awfully all the time. She says there are very good stories in her magazines. Moral teaching, you know, though there is a lot about the world, but that gives us warnings of what we mustn't do. She is always speaking of horrors in the newspapers, saying how awful they are. But of course she repeats them to all sorts of people. She told me she had read of an Indian vivisecting his mother, and when I suggested that it might not be true, she was quite indignant. Her two heroes are General Booth and Edward the Seventh. She is mostly French, is very fat, and wears a wig, I believe. I've never met a person quite like her. Such very quaint interests, terribly bored if left much to herself, and yet she is very sincere and good-natured, and I think she is very old, to have to still go on teaching. One can meet rather funny people at this boarding house. Mrs G, my employer, has an older girl, Eileen, as well as Dennis, the little boy. Eileen is not very strong, weak chest, etc. And perhaps they are going to take her away from school or move from Hartford to a more bracing place. I do hope not for myself. I don't want to have to leave Hartford. However, I shall know soon. Dennis is not to go to school till the beginning of the Christmas term next year, so that is all right for me. I am rather pleased that Mr and Mrs G were distinctly pleased with the examination papers, but they thought I had marked too low. I haven't got a cold now, and I hope all the remedies have worked at home, Vera. Mind you, keep this budget going. I think it is awfully jolly. Why shouldn't our foreign readers contribute a letter to be put in with Vera's? They should send it to home and she must put it in when it comes to her. Love to all, Avis. Enid, 187 Lodge Lane, Liverpool, written on October the 10th, 1906. Dear juniors, bad paper, adds Edmund. 
The budget baby adopts such a respectful style of address that as I am the budget patriarch, I feel I ought to acknowledge her courtesy in a patronising and affable manner. I think the budget is excellent and I only hope that it will not deteriorate after such a brilliant start. Also, I am amazed at the rapidity with which it has gone on its rounds. Avis's budget reached me at midday on Monday, October the 8th, so the Sunday night post is good from Hartford. The reason I asked her to send it on quickly was because Auntie Kitty was leaving on Tuesday, October the 9th, and I wanted to read portions to her before she left. She was extremely amused at the bits about Mother, e.g. the cold caught at 3.10pm, alluded to by Vera, and Cuthbert's friend who was violently ick. These specially appealed to her sense of humour, which is not quite the same type as Aldwin's. She left us yesterday after a fortnight's visit. She is wonderfully well for her age. I think she enjoyed most a dinner party at Mary Wainwright's. It was such unusual dissipation for her. By the by, I will give a prize to that member of the family who, without any reference to the parents, or consultation with each other, or searching in a pedigree, can best describe the exact relationship that the following individuals bear to us. Benjamin Linton, Kathleen Lowe, Kate Horsfall, Amy Anderson, Charles Eyre, Arthur Cox, Douglas Horsfall, Jane Gawler, Daisy Preston. Of course, the answers cannot be put in the budget, but must be sent to me on a postcard. I believe no one will get more than four right. I was going to say that not much has happened, but when I think of my domestics, I feel a great deal has taken place. The French maid, Zélie, is a great success, and Hazel's conversation is now a pleasing mixture of two languages. I think her vocabulary is rather good for a six-year-old child. The cook, Gertrude, has been taken ill. She was not ick, but she had boils. You must not let father hear this. And she had to go home for a rest. A new housemaid arrived without her box, but the box turned up five days after she did. The boot boy has been suddenly dismissed for dishonesty. We made the unpleasing discovery that he was removing stamps from the letters that he took to the post and was then selling them at a little shop to get cigarettes or sweets. So I hope that if any of you have been charged tuppence for my letters lately, you will understand how it was. Hazel returned from a children's service at church the other day, and when asked what the clergyman had said, remarked, he talked a great deal, but I couldn't get hold of anything, which delighted Auntie Kitty and made her laugh, but shocked Mary Wainwright. Owen is playing in the first 11 football team at school and is one of the school librarians. Now, having done my duty as a married woman by discoursing on children and servants, let me change the subject in the time-honoured fashion by stating how beautiful are the pale feathers of a teacock. The family may have heard that Cyril's brother, Charlie Isles, and his engineering firm or rather one of the managers, Rees by name, is busy inventing a new sort of centrifugal pump, for which, if it is successful, there ought to be a very good market. Cyril is aiding him, as it needs very advanced mathematics. It is of great interest to Cyril, and he thinks of it day and night. Arthur, the stag hunt was most interesting, but the end is horrible. Surely it is not considered a sportsmanlike thing to bring a stag back to the beach and cut its throat when it had taken refuge in the sea. I think it deserved its life. As to books, I have hardly read any of those Burr mentions, but I am going to get Viper of Milan, Richard Baldock and Dick. I have been reading Prisoners by M. Cholmondley. I dare say by this time you will all have read it. I think it's well worth reading. The story is painful, but the study of characters is wonderful. The Life of Froud by Herbert Paul is very interesting. I think you would all like it. Possibly too much of the book is taken up with an account of Freeman's animosity and inaccuracy, but the life in itself is interesting and well written. I am now reading A Life of Seymour Vandeleur, an officer in the guards by Colonel Max, 
which we got from the Times Library. I like it so much that we're going to keep it and send it to one of the foreign brothers, probably Neville. Incidentally, it contains most interesting accounts of Uganda, Nigeria, Egypt and the South African War in which van der Leer was killed. The autumn exhibition of pictures in Liverpool is very good. I've just taken a season ticket. Both the Kendalls and Beerbohm Tree are coming here next week to the two main theatres. I wish they would not come together. I have at last made the acquaintance of Miss Walker, who is the niece of Mrs John Leake. She is very good looking and reminds me somewhat of Mrs Eyre in manners. She detests hockey and wears flowing white garments. Your affectionate sister, Enid. This is the end of the first budget. Enid packed up all the letters and posted them back to Bernard, who then begins a second budget and sends it on its rounds. The first budget goes around again, so everyone can read all the letters in budget one whilst they are writing their letter for budget two, and then everybody removes their own letter and posts it back to Vera in Sydenham. It sounds complicated, but it evidently worked for them. Thank you for listening. Have you found these letters interesting? Would you like me to read some more? Or can you explain to me what Enid means when she says, how beautiful are the pale feathers of a teacock, as I haven't a clue. I'm just transcribing these letters, because they're more than a 100 years old, and I think that is interesting in itself. Imagine it. In 1906, Captain Scott has just returned from the Antarctic and has written a book about his journey. Spoiler alert. He dies in 1912 on his second Antarctic expedition. Subjects coming up. Siblings using the telephone for the first time. Suffragettes. First-hand accounts of the funeral procession of King Edward VII, including his little dog Caesar, as well as first-hand accounts of the coronation of George V and Queen Mary. If you'd like to write to me, please send me an email. MachelCoxLetters at gmail.com Thank you. Thank you.